Hello, my name is Amanda Bonikowski, Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Department of Cardiovascular Diseases at Mayo Clinic. And today we're gonna to talk about high intensity interval training. What does it help and how to do it? First, let's start with what does it help? And within this section, we're gonna learn about the different, both healthy and chronic disease states that high intensity interval training and really interval training can help with. So the benefits of HIT, the, the number one primary benefit is the increase in cardiorespiratory fitness or your peak VO2. And this is occurring uh, with interval training in both healthy individuals as well as a wide spectrum of chronic disease states. And now why is this so important and why is this the number one benefit? Well, because we've known for a while that one MET or metabolic equivalent increase in fitness is related to a 13% reduction in all-cause mortality and then it's also related to a 15% reduction in cardiovascular related mortality. So an increase in cardiorespiratory fitness is incredibly important. While the majority of the talk today will center around health related fitness, interval training is also an excellent strategy to avoid overtraining uh, for athletes as well. So now let's discuss the literature related to these chronic disease states and the benefits of interval training. First, uh, interval training in lifestyle-induced cardiometabolic disease. Here, this meta-analysis and systematic review demonstrates nicely that interval training is superior or favored over moderate intensity continuous training for increasing peak VO2. The next group we can look at is interval training in coronary artery disease. We're gonna see a similar pattern here and a similar trend that again, interval training is favored over continuous training for increasing peak VO2. And recall again, the importance of increasing peak VO2 is the relation to the reduction in all cause and CV mortality. Now specific to patients with coronary artery disease who have attended cardiac rehab, uh, we have, it's been found that for every one met improvement in fitness, there's a 25% reduction in all-cause mortality. So again, stressing the importance of increasing fitness. Then we can move on to interval training and heart failure. The studies that have been conducted in, in this area have demonstrated that intensity is a very important factor in regards to increasing peak VO2. Uh, this specific study found that for a 10% increase in intensity, there was a one milliliter per kilogram per minute increase in peak VO2. Again, we see a trend here. Increase in peak VO2 is incredibly important. There were other important benefits to interval training in patients with heart failure. There was favorable left ventricular remodeling. One important note, the ejection fraction response is variable in heart failure training studies. However, what might be more important one would be improvement in vascular function, but then especially in this population, interval training uh, has demonstrated improvements in quality of life. We'll move on to patients who have received a heart transplant. So interval training studies have also demonstrated increases in VO2 max or VO2 peak in patients who have received a heart transplant. There are multiple additional benefits to interval training in patients um, who have received a heart transplant, both central as well as peripheral factors. And interestingly here on this figure, we, we see the heart rate response to the intervals three months post-transplant, post again, understanding that the patient has been denervated. And then we see again at 12 months post-transplant, and now we see the heart rate adaptations to the interval training exercise. And again, very importantly, and uh, very important in this population is that the interval training improves quality of life. Now let's move on to some other benefits of interval training. So we see multiple benefits in other health-related markers, um, and there'll be both similar and superior improvements in many of these markers. Now the superior improvements are going to occur when the interval training is volume matched to a moderate intensity continuous training program. But the really great benefit is that we see similar improvements in many of these health-related biomarkers, even at low volume and low intensity training. Another benefit is that there's an increased perception of enjoyment when patients perform this type of training. And that may be in large part due to the time efficiency of the exercise training program. Again, we can volume match the 
interval training, which often is very similar to, say, a 30-minute or longer exercise training program. However, what individuals likely find most enjoyable is the short duration of more of the low volume and even lower intensity interval training programs. A little more literature on the impact on cardiometabolic risk factors with interval training. So in normal weight individuals as well as overweight individuals, we again continue to see that improvement in VO2 max as well as other health-related markers, seeing those very positive physiologic adaptations to an interval training program. And then another wonderful aspect to interval training is that it's never too late to start. Robinson and colleagues conducted this study where they had three training groups, uh, high-intensity interval training, uh, resistance training group, and then a combination training group. And here again, we see this common trend even in older individuals who were previously sedentary, an interval training group can significantly increase their VO2 peak. Uh, and also we see improvements in their fat-free mass as well. So again, it's never too late to start an interval training program. Finally, with the benefits of HIT, intensity isn't everything. So Karstoff and colleagues conducted a free living interval walking study. And here again, we see increases in VO2 peak as well as a reduction in fat mass in the interval walking group compared to the continuous walking group and, of course, compared to the control group. So even an interval walking program is effective for increasing fitness. So we've covered what the benefits are of interval training. Now let's move on to how, how are we going to do interval training. Well, for starters, interval training is short periods of higher intensity exercise followed by lower intensity exercise. And the figure I've shared here is from our education handout that we have for interval training. And while this figure demonstrates a probably volume matched uh, exercise training session, uh, we see there as well, though, that the intervals can be variable. You know, here we suggest 30 to 120 seconds, but intervals can be even as low as 10 seconds for those of you familiar with the Tabata protocol. And at the end of the day, interval training is really infinitely variable. You can adjust the work to rest ratios to whatever your preference, and same with the intensity. As we just saw, a, a walking program is even effective for increasing cardiorespiratory fitness. We recommend using the Borg Rating of Perceived Exertion Scale to guide the intensity of the exercise. We can absolutely use heart rate and or peak VO2 to determine exercise intensity. Um, however, the Borg is a, a very uh, feasible and easy to use scale to adjust our intensity or to rate our own intensity for the activity that we're doing. So of course, like any other exercise program, you're gonna start with a warm up. Um, if your patient or participant is new to exercise, it may be helpful to start with short intervals, that 30 second range or even, even shorter, and then considering one to three interval cycles during their exercise session. Of course, finish with a cool down as you normally would, and then incorporate intervals multiple times per week. Three times per week is probably a great place to start. A few other protocols uh, to consider, the Norwegian model, which is your four by four protocol, four minute intervals with uh, four four minute intervals. And this one again is more of a volume match to a typical moderate intensity uh, training program. Another option would be this low volume hit where we see here that your overall training is about 10 minutes. So these are 30 second intervals and about four to six repeats during an exercise session. And then researchers within this same group that published this low volume HIT study have also then gone to the one minute workout, Dr. Martin Gabala out of Canada, where they did 20 second intervals uh, three times, three times per week. So again, really getting to the limits of the lowest amount of training that will still produce uh, physiologic adaptations. So our take home points from today, HIT is a powerful intervention in both health and chronic disease states and absolutely results in physiologic adaptations that are linked to improve health. And I think one of the biggest important takeaways here is that the volume of training um, is going to produce physiologic adaptations, even if it's very small. Um, and when we perform small volumes of training, we'll expect similar adaptations to moderate intensity continuous training. But then when we volume match, then the 
adaptations are going to be uh, superior to moderate intensity training. It's a time efficient exercise strategy. As we saw, there are multiple protocols and we can get down to a very low volume of exercise in a week. And important to note here as well is that even one session of interval training per week has been linked to an increase uh, peak VO2 as well as body composition changes. And finally, that wide variety of protocols are available. So we're likely to find a protocol that will be suited for just about anyone. And with that, I thank you for your time.